up to, from the first up to the 13th chapter, Jesus has been speaking to his, to the general populace. From portions of the 13th chapter up to the 16th chapter, Jesus is speaking and giving specific instructions to the 12, knowing that his death is imminent. The 17th chapter, Jesus prays an open prayer specifically to God. He begins in the first six verses praying for the disciples. From there, he says something that has profound implication for every believer. He prays that no believer will be lost. And he says specifically that for that prayer was to extend from all those who would be saved because of the initial preaching of the disciples and those who would come thereafter. Jesus actually prayed for everybody in this room. He had you in his mind. And the scripture tells us that when Jesus ascended, he went to be at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. And we said, do you realize that Jesus prayed for you this morning? He's not something in the past. His ministry has not completed. He's not done. His relationship isn't built in a philosophy. But Jesus himself. You realize that we serve a five foot, six inch Jewish carpenter? That was the average height of somebody in those days. Jesus ascended in bodily form, a new body. He'll be the only wounded and handicapped person in heaven nail prints in his hands nail prints in his feet a scar in his side is evidence that he is the son of David that he is the Messiah spoken of in Isaiah 53 and standing there in that bodily form he stood before the throne today and he called you up before God knowing you personally, if you are a believer. How's that for never being alone? Sobering, isn't it? Jesus in the 17th chapter concludes his prayer for those afar off, you and me, for those who were close by, the 11 who remained. And in the 18th chapter, he begins to walk a path that will take him to his death within the next 24 hours in a sequence. He has told them that they are the vines and that we are the vines and that he is the root of that vine and that we are to bear fruit and that fruit is to be love that it's to be those things spoken of in Galatians, the fifth chapter, 22nd verse through the end of the chapter. And now having concluded all that he said, he begins to walk. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples had entered. Now, it was not uncommon for people who had a great deal of money and financial resource to own gated gardens in the area that we know as Gethsemane. And it is not unreasonable to assume that since Jesus and his disciples have been to this garden, numerous times. In fact, 
we'll find in the next verse, so numerous that Judas knew exactly where to find Jesus because he had been there with Jesus numerous times. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. That Jesus had access to one of the garden spaces. The scripture says that in the path that he took, he went across the brook of Kidron. Kidron, translated into English, means dark waters. And it had that name for a very specific reason. It rested at the edge of the temple grounds. And all the sheep that were slaughtered during the Passover for the sin offerings, their blood would run through parapet troughs that emptied into the brook Kidron. And to give you an idea how many of those there were, you know, the Jews were anathema to the idea of taking a census. They chafed at the idea of being counted. Do you remember what happened when there was a census ordered and God punished the people for none for having numbered the, numbering the people? As a matter of fact, if you get to be around Jews today, whether it be in the United States or whether it be in Israel, they don't count one another. If they have to choose up sides for a sporting event to form a team, they point at each person and say, not one, not two, not three, <laughs> not four. And the reason they do it is they're not counting. They take it very seriously. So instead of making a count for the number of people who were in Jerusalem during the Passover season. They counted the number of sheep that were sacrificed. And Josephus, the historian, tells us <clears throat> that at this particular season, 250,000 lambs were offered for sin offerings at the temple and the blood of 250,000 lambs flowed through the brook Kidron that Jesus and his disciples walked through. Now we know this, the reason they counted the lambs was because the Jewish law, if you remember from our study in the Pentateuch, Jewish law was that it took at least 10 persons, a lamb was not to be eaten by less than 10 people which means at the time with 256,000 lambs, there were at least 2.6 million Jews in Jerusalem that, at that time. No small group. And the entire place was buzzing about a prophet named Jesus. Jesus now crosses the brook of dark water goes to the private garden that has been afforded to him and his disciples so many times. Third verse. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. The word detachment is very specific for Romans. A detachment also called a cohort, was no fewer than 650 troops. And there was such a thing as a, a reinforced cohort that included 650 foot soldiers and it included 250 cavalry. We are not sure the exact number, but we do know that there was a group from the chief priests and Pharisees, which were temple guards, not member of the Roman guard, but the detachment of troops specifically spoke to that group of Romans. This was no small group that went to the garden to make an arrest. Well, you might say, what in the world would that number of Roman soldiers have, why would they be dispatched when they only reasonably expected 11 disciples and the rabbi named Jesus. 
Well, you have to know something about Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate did not like the Jews. Pontius Pilate was assigned <laughs> as the procurator of Judea because it was kind of the armpit of the empire. He was the low man on the totem pole and not particularly well liked in the halls of government. As a matter of fact, we're told by Roman historians that there was an event where Pontius Pilate, wanting to show Caesar that he was going to adhere to Roman law exactly, almost as if trying to make amends for some offense, followed the Roman custom of placing the banners of the legions who would enter Jerusalem with him at the forefront of those soldiers who marched into the city. And as was the custom with the legions, considering Caesar to be a deity, that they would take graven images of a bust, the head of Caesar, and they would go above the flags of the legions and they would march into the city with it, which incensed the Jews. The three procurators before Pontius Pilate had consented to remove the heads so that there would be no graven image. you remember the first commandment? Both the Lord thy God, and to have no graven images before him, no gods before him. Pontius Pilate made his entry with the graven images. And the Jews were incensed. And they were so incensed that they followed him all the way back from Jerusalem, screaming and shouting to the place where the Roman procurator actually lived, which was in Caesarea. Caesarea was a city that where the Romans lived. They didn't live in Jerusalem. And Caesarea was built by Herod, by Herod and Herod did it to gain favor with the Roman government. It was all politics. And the city was built as a microcosm of Rome with Roman columns, all those things, and even had its own Colosseum, the circus. And when they followed the new procurator, Pontius Pilate, all the way back to Caesarea, yelling and screaming loudly at him because of his defaming the holy city, the city of David, the place where the temple resided. He led them into the Colosseum. And when he got them into the Colosseum, he stood up and he screamed at them and said, you knock off the noise or I'll kill every one of you. He started off on a very bad foot with the Jews. And they all took off their tunics and they said, kill us or not, we will not tolerate your idolatry in our city. And they stood there and said, kill us. He couldn't kill over a million Jews. The thing calmed down. They opened the gates to the Colosseum. The Jews left and went back to Jerusalem, except for members of the ruling council. The Roman historians tell us that they made the trip to Rome and they sought audience with Caesar himself, recounted the stories and told them that Judea was on the verge of riot and rebellion because of the act of Pontius Pilate. And Rome censured him and told him in no uncertain terms, if Judea breaks into riot, it's your head. Now this becomes important when you see the way that Pilate deals with Jesus because he is deathly afraid of a report to the emperor. Then Judas, having received a detachment from the troops and officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons because it was reported 
that this man, Jesus, was declaring himself to be the king of the Jews and that rebellion might well be at a foot. And Pilate was not going to let that happen. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, who are you seeking? Now point this out. There may have been as many as a thousand troops with 250 cavalry. The temple guards were there. Only 11 disciples and just Jesus. And Jesus is completely and totally in control. Nothing is out of control. Friends, and the things that we are facing in our own nation in the way our Supreme Court and the way that our government seems to have turned any semblance of its heart from God, I promise you that in the mind of God, nothing is out of control. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus said, I am he. Now, in your translation, the one that you're reading, you may notice that the word he is in parentheses. There's a reason. It was added by the translator. It is not in the original Greek text. Jesus confronts Jews, temple guards, and when they say they're here for Jesus of Nazareth, <coughs> what he actually says, when you read it in the Greek, he stands up, he faces his, them and says, I am. Do you remember when, when Moses stood on holy ground taking the shoes off of his feet before a burning bush? And God tells him that he's going to send them to rescue the Jews from the hands of the Egyptians. And Moses <coughs> says, when I go, they're going to ask me what your name is. Who should I tell them sent me? And he says, I am that I am. I am the existent one. I'm the one that always was, am now, and will ever be. I am the one that is over everything, and there is none other like me. And Jesus stands up in front of those Jews and when they say we seek Jesus of Nazareth, he stands up in front of them fully in charge, fully in control, and he says, I am. Now, when he said to them, I am, they drew back and they fell on the ground. I am, well, all I can say to that is, I'll bet. <laughs> they knew exactly what he was saying. For all those who have heard people say that Jesus never claimed to be God, how many times in the book of John have we covered instances where there was no other possible interpretation of what was said? Jesus just said it. He said, I am. Now, when he said that to them, I am, they drew back and they fell on the ground. Then he asked them again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you, I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me. I have lost none. Remember, he said it in the 17th chapter. Now, Simon Peter takes a really bad rap because in just a few verses, it's going to record the story of his, quote, denying Jesus three times. And there are those who have postulated it was because Simon was actually a blowhard and a coward. I will tell you that what you will see next is ample proof that Simon was no coward. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it 
and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, listen to what he says. Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Now, what he does not say is as important as what he does say. Did Jesus turn around and say, Peter, I told you to get rid of that sword. Christians don't have swords. No. Did Jesus rebuke him for having the sword in that circumstance? No. Did Jesus rebuke him for using the sword? No. I would suggest to you that this is the preamble to the Second Amendment. <laughs> There's no place in Scripture where it says Christians are not to have, have dealings with, or use guns. As a matter of fact, when Jesus speaks to the disciples, open and out on the road, he says, now I tell you, when I sent you out the first time, I told you to take no script. I told you not to take a sword. I told you not to take anything. Everything will be provided for you because I sent you. And then when you get out there, you take of the power that I placed on you and you set the people free. And they all came back excited because they did, everything happened just the way Jesus said it would. Now Jesus on the road says, now I tell you, I'm not going to be with you long. If you don't have a sword, go sell your coat and get one. He spoke to all 12. Go and buy a sword. And the sword he was talking about was the Roman Almathea. Which frankly, there are questions about whether or not it was legal for anybody but a Roman soldier to own one. That sucker was a fully automatic sword. <laughs> oh, an assault sword. That's what it was. And Jesus said, not only wait, don't wait until you've got enough money saved up. He said, go sell your coat. And he commanded them to have one. Now, Liberal theologians will come back and say, yes, but shortly thereafter, the disciples said, yeah, Jesus, we have three swords here among us, or two swords, whatever it was. And Jesus said, it's enough. Unfortunately, they spent too much time in philosophy class and not enough time in Greek class. Because if you read it in the grammatical context in which it said, this is how it really sounded. They said, well, Jesus, we know you said, go, go sell your stuff, buy a sword, everybody go get a sword. And not only that, get the state of the art sword. It says, we got three of them here. And Jesus turns around and says, essentially, I told you what to do. I don't want to hear any more conversation about this. Not three swords or no. It's bad grammar in Greek. <laughs> Little side point, but it bears speaking. I could not go past that. <laughs> Jesus rebukes Peter, having nothing to do with his sword. Nothing. He rebukes Peter because Jesus is in control and he has come to this earth for this purpose. They are not taking him prisoner. He went to the forefront and he said, I am. You wanted me? You got me. I'm here. Let these go. They no longer have anything to do with us. Not yet. And when Peter would stand in the way of the purposes and plans of God that Jesus has earnestly submitted to, Jesus turns on the one that he loves and he rebukes him and says, essentially, I love you but get between me and Jesus, and there's no question about how this is going to end. Friends, that's a relationship that true Christians should have with one another. I'm with you. 
I love you. But I'm going to follow Jesus whether you do or not. No matter what it costs me. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. The contingent of troops and then the officers of the temple guard of the Jews. Arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. This was John Gotti and Al Capone. No, it was. You might ask, so how come they take him to this guy, Annas, before he goes to the high priest? <coughs> Here's the reason. Annas has been the high priest in the past, and this guy has, has all the rackets in Jerusalem. He's been high priest. <coughs> Let me tell you about some of his enterprises. Annas owns a huge number of fishing boats. <coughs> and you couldn't get f fresh fish in the city. It was difficult because they had no refrigeration. He owned the salt packing company. And they would salt the fish and get it out to anybody. And if you wanted to have fish, you did business with Annas. And if you didn't do business with Annas, you didn't eat fish. But see, Annas had another racket going. <coughs> do you remember the story of Jesus coming to the temple and finding in the outer courts that they were buying and selling? And he took and he made a whip of cords and he drove them out of the area and he says, my father's house should be known as a house of prayer, not a house of merchant merchandise. The reason he did that, number one, is because the outer park court was the only place a Gentile could go into and get on his face before God and pray. And they had taken it up for their religious purposes and practices. For the sacrifice, knowing nothing of the Savior it represented. He had a heart for Gentiles. Secondly, they had the rackets going big time. You see, you could go out on the street and you could get a turtle dove or a pigeon and you could buy it from somebody for probably 20 cents. As a matter of fact, if you will notice, when Mary completed the days of her purification, she went into the temple to make the offering that was required and she brought two turtle doves. Why? Because pigeons were all over Israel. All over. And anybody could catch a pigeon. You didn't even need any money. And the offering could be either a lamb that you could bring, which meant some considerable expense. Or you could even bring as little as two turtle doves. It was the act of the heart. It wasn't the expense of the thing being sacrificed. Whatever was within your means, you could go and catch that dove. <clears throat> the racket was that when people came to the temple because that's where the sacrifice had to be made you had to show that animal to the priest that all worked for Annas and if he found any spot on the animal say oh I'm sorry you can't sacrifice that animal but if you'll come over here to, to, to honest Jose's sheep sales will get you an animal that's pre-inspected and you can sacrifice that animal. Of course, there will be a small surcharge. You could catch a dove or a pigeon and you could bring it to the temple or you could buy one there or you could buy it outside the temple for 20 cents you went into the temple, it cost you 15 bucks. Sheep was the same way. In the early church, you know what the scripture says that Jesus is going to present us without spot or wrinkle? That was actually a pun. You know why? Because the early church, knowing the story about getting ripped off at the temple for a spot on the sacrifice, 
They used to call people who said they were Christians and there was no evidence in their life, they called them spots. They were spots. And when they talked about presenting us with no spot or wrinkle, he was going to present us with every evidence that we were real. That's what it meant. Annas had the rackets going big time, and Jesus had had run-ins with him before. And he was recognized as the godfather of the temple. You see, the priesthood had deteriorated to such a degree that the high priest to appease Rome was appointed by the Roman government, not of a, her of, of a, of a hereditary line for the high priest. They had made so many compromises with the Romans that the church, well, see if this sounds like anything you know. The official religious establishment had thrown in with and become substance, uh, subject to the one world government, the government that controlled most of the civilized world. Wow. History kind of repeats itself, doesn't it? Sobering. So when he first goes to Annas, those that took him, took him to the real seat of power in that temple. And then Annas had five sons, and each one had rotated through the chief priest position. And Caiaphas was his son-in-law. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man should die for the people. He didn't have any idea how true what he was saying. We needed the death of Jesus for us. But that's not what he meant. <clears throat> what he meant was that they could not afford a run-in with Caesar. That it 